Welcome to this edition of EuroQuestions. The Leaders Summit on Climate convened by President Joe Biden on Thursday will be a key moment for Europeans to take stock of the fact that after the major announcements by the USA, China, Japan, and many other countries, 75% of the global economy now lies in countries that aim to reach climate neutrality. Today, we welcome our senior policy fellow, Thomas pellerin carlin director of the Jacques Delors Energy Center at the Jacques Delors Institute. His presentation will focus on the EU's climate policy and the role it should have in this newfound global impetus for climate neutrality. Please do not hesitate to ask your questions throughout the webinar by using the Q&A tool available on your screen. Our speaker will answer them in the second part of this webinar. Without further ado, I leave the floor to Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Mathieu. Uh, so I'm happy that we are having this conversation today uh, because tomorrow is a big day. For, for climate and therefore for uh, you know, the future of humanity in the end. Um, so tomorrow is Earth Day and it is the moment uh, that Joe Biden has chosen to convene 40 world leaders uh, to talk about climate. So the Chinese president, uh, President Xi will be there, but there will be also uh, the French president Emmanuel Macron, the German uh, Bundeskanzlerin uh, Angela Merkel, uh, and obviously Ursula von der Leyen, president of the European Commission. And this happens at a key moment for the European uh, domestic uh, climate policy, uh, because this very morning, uh, the European uh, Parliament and the Council of the European Union found an agreement on the first EU climate law. Uh, and this paves the way for a lot of discussions that we are going to have on uh, how green the economic recovery plans of the member states of the European Union uh, are. Uh, and also um, a big, big moment will be in June, uh, where the Commission will make major legislative proposal in the so-called uh, fit for 55 package. So this climate summit um, occurs after major announcements that happened during the last two years, uh, as you can see on, on the next slide. So as you know, you know, two years ago, we had the European elections. Uh, we had millions of European citizens that went to the poll to elect a new parliament. And this parliament in turn uh, chose to elect Ursula von der Leyen as president of the commission. And president von der Leyen made clear that her number one priority is the European Green Deal. And she clearly stated that she wants Europe to become climate neutral by 2030. And that's what you can see here on the middle of the slide, the moment when she got elected in July 2019, where Europe, that represents around 20% of the world economy, was the first major economy in the world to say, we are going to be climate neutral by 2050. After these EU announcements, we saw a few other countries uh, kind of following the European Union, countries like New Zealand, like Argentina, like South Africa. Um, but the major announcement came later uh, that year uh, with China, uh, with President Xi announcing at the United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, that China uh, will, will aim to be carbon neutral by 2060. And after this announcement, uh, we saw uh, announcements from South Korea, from Japan, from the United States after the election of Joe Biden uh, that were also announcing that they would have the same target as the European Union, uh, so the target to reach climate neutrality by 2050. So in the end, we now have 75% of the global economy that has almost the same uh, climate objective for the long term. And that's a game-changing element uh, because two years ago, virtually no economy in the world uh, was uh, was uh, you know aiming for for that uh, climate neutrality objective. So, um, what is climate neutrality, and why does it matter so much? Um, climate neutrality matters because it is the necessary condition to avoid catastrophic climate change. To be climate neutral means that you reduce greenhouse gas emissions to very, very, very low levels. And those levels are so low that those small residual emissions can be compensated by offsetting measures uh, such as uh, reforestation. So in practice, uh, this requires radical changes to the way we produce, we consume, we transport, we eat, uh, essentially, you know, to the way we live. And we need that to happen in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. And as um, Bill Gates uh, recalled in his recent book, uh, such radical changes can only occur with massive innovation. 
So I want to put that as as simple term, terms as possible um, to help you understand, you know, what this particular graph shows and why it is so important to talk about innovation when we talk about climate change. In this graph, you can first focus on the blue and the green section. And this talks about the first innovation challenge when it comes to tackling climate change. And this first challenge is to innovate in order to deploy solutions that already exist, but have, that have not been deployed at scale for now. So for instance, we need to deeply renovate almost all of the buildings in the world. We also need to replace all the oil powered buses, so buses that use uh, diesel or gasoline, and replace them with electric buses. We also need to find ways to encourage as many people as possible uh, to use what we call soft modes of transportation. So that's walking, that's cycling, uh, that's taking public transport. Um, so all those are you know, solutions that technically exist. Uh, electric buses are already a technical uh, reality, for instance. Um, but this requires nonetheless innovation in new infrastructures. Uh, we, as humans, need also to develop new habits. We need to create new techniques. Companies need to develop new business models. And the financial sector needs to come up with new financing schemes uh, that help small businesses uh, and individual citizens to make the shift uh, towards uh, a clean energy option, option uh, for instance, that supports uh, families to renovate their own houses with a, an easy access to credit uh, through the local banks, uh, for instance. And if we do this right, then we will have done more than half of what we need to do to avoid a climate disaster. And so that's what you see in blue and in green. That's how much of the way to climate neutrality we can get if we, uh, quote unquote, just innovate uh, to deploy the technical solutions that already exist. But this will not be enough. There is also a second uh, innovation challenge. And the second innovation challenge is to create and then later deploy solutions that currently either do not exist at all or exist only in labs and have not been tested at scale um, in real life conditions. And that's what you see in yellow and in orange uh, in, uh, in that graph, uh, which by the way is coming from the International Energy Agency. So this second innovation challenge you know, can be summarized by you know, the question of how do we find totally new ways to produce steel, to produce aluminum, to produce cement, to produce those goods, those products that are essential to uh, you know, our modern economy, and that currently we don't know how to produce in a way that is 100% green. So how do we invent, how do we test, how do we deploy also those new solutions as soon as possible uh, in order to avoid a climate disaster? So during the, the last month at the Jacques Delon Institute, we have led research to see how the European Union can tackle those two innovation challenges. And as you can see on the next slide, our conclusion is simple. Um, to avoid a climate disaster, the European Union needs a bold policy to support clean innovation. And that policy needs to articulate the five key tools that you now have in front of you. First, we need more public funding for green innovation. Uh, this increase in public funding will uh, help innovators and researchers invent totally new clean technologies. Stuff that currently, you know, we, we don't really know what they're going to be, uh, but some of them will be vital in order to uh, help us uh, deliver climate neutrality. But public funding for innovation is also important to improve the clean solutions that already exist, to make, uh, for instance, solar panels more efficient, uh, to make uh, batteries uh, more green, uh, more easily recyclable, uh, for instance. So public funding for innovation is also very important to make all the already available solutions cheaper and easier to be used and introduced in daily human life. The second key tool that the European Union has um, is adopting strict and ambitious regulations. And this is something that is extremely important. You know, sometimes 
you need very ambitious regulations to force change. And regulation from that perspective uh, is a very, very powerful tool to stimulate innovation. The third policy tool is what you can see at the right uh, of this slide is to deploy the right clean infrastructure. Uh, so here you can think about uh, uh, biking lanes in cities that need to be secure so people feel safe when they are riding their bike uh, to go to work or to pick up kids from school, for instance. But you can also think about uh, charging points for electric vehicles, for instance, to allow people living in rural areas to make the switch from the current oil car towards uh, an electric car as people in rural areas will need some uh, amount uh, of electric cars, of cars at least, uh, in order to be able to move in those uh, less densely populated areas of Europe. Um, the fourth tool is the one you have at the center of this slide, um, is you know, the idea that we need you know, to make sure that the people who pollute pay for the pollution they produce. Uh, it's what we call the, the polluter pays uh, uh, principle. And here the idea is not you know, to punish polluters. It's not, not to make them pay because you know, polluting is bad and they should be punished as a result. That's not the, the reasoning behind this recommendation. Uh, the reasoning uh, is different, is that if you make polluters pay, then you give them a financial incentive to change, a financial incentive to adopt the clean solutions that will help them pollute less and therefore pay less. And eventually, uh, you know, uh, it will help them pollute, not at all, pollute zero. And so they will need to pay, you know, zero in terms of uh, uh, carbon prices uh, or, uh, or carbon taxation, for instance. Um, and finally, um, once you know you have done all this, uh, then it's also important to adopt regulation to exclude from the market all the very polluting products that can be easily replaced by clean products. And this is something that is not very popular, but it is something that we in Europe have been doing for decades. Uh, for decades, we've been putting out of the market stuff that were you know just too bad for the environment and or too bad for human health or too inefficient. Um, for instance, in the 70s, we banned a pesticide called DDT. Uh, uh, some decades ago, we also banned all the products that were using uh, asbestos because it's very harmful for human health. And more recently, we banned the very inefficient technologies like the incandescent light bulbs uh, that is now replaced mostly uh, with uh, LEDs. And that's also what we need to do now on other highly polluting products uh, such as coal, uh, also such as sport utility vehicles, the, the famous SUVs. So once we have those you know, five generic policy tools, the question becomes, you know, what can European policymakers do today? What are the policy files that are debated uh, in the European Union in 2021 and where members of the European Parliament, uh, commissioners from the European Commission and ministers from the national government can you know, take concrete decisions uh, to make sure we uh, try to avoid uh, a climate disaster. So to answer that question, we have published three policy papers uh, and, an, and uh, an infographic. And I want to summarize here our four main policy recommendations. So on the next slide, you can see the, the two first recommendations that, uh, that we have. The first recommendation is that we need uh, a major ambitious EU regulatory reform. And so regulation is very, very, very important when it comes to avoiding a climate disaster and also when it comes to stimulating clean innovation. So this June, the European Commission will present an overall of the European uh, uh, buildings, energy, industry and mobility uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, it's called the Fit for 55 package uh, because its aim is to adapt the EU legislation to deliver uh, a reduction of greenhouse gas emission by uh, of at least 55% uh, by 2030. And in our latest policy paper with uh, Marion Bachelet, uh, we show that this Fit for 55 package is a once in a decade opportunity to adopt the right legislation that will help us avoid a climate disaster. So in essence, to make the best out of this Fit for 55 package, we argue that the European Commission should propose 
a package that is also fit for climate neutrality and that is also fit for climate innovation. And this is extremely important and will, uh, will be you know, vital in my view to help citizens understand whether the European Green Deal is a serious way to address climate change or whether it's you know, just uh, some greenwashing exercise to, to, to put it uh, simply. The second recommendation that we come up with is um, how, to, how do you know to increase uh, the carbon price in order to help companies uh, innovate and, uh, and invest in the, in the right kind of uh, clean energy innovation. So this June also, the European Commission will um, present a reform of its carbon pricing mechanisms. And this is also important, but in a different manner from regulation. Um, what our research shows is that carbon pricing should not and cannot be the cornerstone of the EU climate policy. Carbon pricing has many flaws, it has many drawbacks, and it is generally speaking quite unpopular. However, carbon pricing is nonetheless a very important tool to accelerate the green, tra the green transition. You can think of it you know, as a catalyst. It will not create totally new stuff, but it will speed up the adoption of clean energy solution, and it will therefore speed up uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's extremely important because, you know, let's remember that climate change is a race against time. So the faster we can deploy the solutions, the more likely we are to avoid a climate disaster. So we argue in another policy paper co-written with a think tank E3G uh, that we indeed need an ambitious reform of the EU carbon market. Uh, we need to put a higher price on the carbon emissions coming from the electricity, the industry, and the aviation sectors. This will not save the world, but it will be helpful in accelerating the transition that we need in order to save the world. Um, finally, on the next slide, you can see our third and fourth uh, policy recommendation. Uh, so the third one is about the green recovery. Um, and so we indeed need to re-channel investment in Europe. Uh, we need to stop investing in polluting projects and invest more in green projects. And that's why at the Jacques Delors Institute, we are uh, pursuing our research on the green recovery uh, with colleagues such as uh, Andreas Eisel. Uh, and we, we aim to come up with a new publication on this in the, in the coming month, as we know more about what the member states intend to present to the Commission in terms of recovery uh, plans. And our fourth and final recommendation for today um, is about global action. Um, you know, climate change is a global phenomenon and solving climate change requires a global action. And that's actually why European innovation is super important. Because the objective of the European Union is not only to make Europe climate neutral, it is to make Europe climate neutral in a way that we develop the concrete solutions that other continents, that other countries can adopt and can use so they themselves can become also climate neutral. So in that endeavor, uh, one vital element is a renewed cooperation between the European Union and the USA, the United States. And our third policy paper with uh, Arno Barrichella uh, focuses on concrete ways uh, that Ursula von der Leyen and Joe Biden can work together uh, to help us uh, avoid a climate, uh, a climate disaster. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm happy to, to take your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So indeed, we've uh, received uh, some questions already from, from our audience. Um, the first question is one of the first elements that you mentioned in your presentation, which is uh, the, the new deal reached uh, this morning uh, within European institutions on a 55% objective um, for 2030. Uh, so uh, what is your take on this, uh, on this new climate law? And uh, how do you think it will be effective in the future to reach the objective it sets out? Yeah, so this very morning, there was a, a compromise reach uh, between uh, uh, the delegation of the European Parliament and the delegation of the Council uh, of the European Union on the EU climate law. Um, and I think um, there are three main outcomes from that negotiation. Um, the first one is that it enshrines into EU law uh, the long-term objective of reaching climate neutrality by 2050. Um, and so that was expected, but uh, that is important. 
it also sets um, a, a relatively ambitious uh, milestone on that way to climate neutrality. And this milestone is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% uh, by 2030. Um, so to understand that how you know this is relatively ambitious, um, so when we talk about those percentage, we always refer to the 1990 level of emissions. So by definition, at, in 1990, we were at 100 um, in terms of level of emission. Currently, uh, you know, uh, well, currently, I would say in 2019, before COVID, uh, we were around, uh, we went from around 100 to around 75. And now the question is, how can we get from, you know, that level uh, of 75 to 45? So that's a, a very steep decline. Uh, that should happen in this decade, the 2020 decade, if we want to deliver on that 55% uh, um, uh, objective. Um, so that's, you know, relatively ambitious. Some people, especially the European Parliament, was arguing for an even higher target of 60%, but the deal that they reached was uh, on this. And the third element that has not been a lot really discussed, but I think is quite important also in terms of transparency and of democracy, is the creation of a new body uh, that is um, a European scientific advisory hub on climate, uh, which you know ideally would behave like uh, what already exists in the United Kingdom, uh, the so-called climate change committee. Uh, so I still need to, to see in the details of the legislation uh, what the role of that new body will be, but hopefully this could be a scientific body that would be able to provide policymakers with the latest uh, most recent understanding, scientific understanding of climate change, but also of the solutions. And to me, that is also super important from a democratic perspective, because it will give science a bigger voice in the EU policy debate. And members of the European Parliament, but also people from the Commission will be able to, uh, uh, to ask scientists directly, rather than asking lobbyists, uh, what, should, uh, what should be done. So I think having also this body would be um, extremely important in order to provide science-based uh, evidence to, to policymakers and therefore, you know, help European policymakers uh, promote the general interest of, uh, you know, the European citizenry. Thank you. So the next question uh, that, that is submitted is, so very interesting presentation. However, quite surprised that Notre Hop gives little consideration to just transition focuses, focus is very much on innovation. Uh, maybe if I can also answer this question to say that it is just transition is a team that uh, team that's really dear to the Institute and our Jack Delors Energy Center along with our researcher Sofia Fernandez have already worked a lot on the question. So over to, to Thomas, if you want to <laughs> this comment. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit um, yeah. Um, Sorry, it's just a bit surprising to me because I mean I've, I've been spending my month of December and January on, on, on just transition and fighting energy poverty. Uh, so I mean from our perspective at the Jacques Delors Institute, um, the Green Deal needs to work on two legs uh, politically. Um, the first leg, uh, I, mean, I mean the two legs are equally important. Uh, one of those two legs uh, is innovation, and the other uh, leg is just transition. Uh, the reason behind reasoning behind that, if I can put that, you know, in very very uh, political terms, uh, let's say that one leg would speak more to, let's say, the half, um, I mean, the the, the left half of the uh, European political spectrum, while the innovation leg is more likely to talk also to the right uh, uh, side of the political spectrum to oversimplify uh, our thinking. Uh, but uh, uh, for instance, I mean, I, I made a whole presentation on energy poverty yesterday uh, at the invitation of the. Uh, uh, European Economic and Social Committee. So just transition is very, very much front and center in our priorities, uh, and it is as important for us uh, as the issue of uh, clean innovation. And actually, just to maybe provide a concrete example, uh, those two things need to work in synergy. Um, let, let's take a very concrete example. Um, if we want to avoid a climate disaster, we need to renovate all the buildings in the world, virtually all of them. Uh, and we need to do that you know, in the next 29 years. So we need to renovate, to deeply renovate around 3% of all buildings every year, between 3 and 4% of all buildings every year. Currently, the rate of deep renovation, so you take a crappy building and you transform that into a super efficient building, this rate is not 4%, it's not 3%, it's not even 1%, it's 0.2% in Europe. So we need to go from 0.2 to between 3 and 4. 
that's something that requires a lot of innovation because we can't you know, just multiply by 20 the number of people that are working in the building sector. Uh, so we need to find other ways uh, to, to do that and also ways to do that cheaper. Uh, so that requires a lot of innovation. When you talk to innovators uh, uh, in the building sector, and a lot of them are part of a project uh, that is originally an EU finance project called Energiesprong, uh, that was developed in the Netherlands and nice deployed also in Germany and in France. When you talk to them, they say, okay, uh, what we need now in order to be able to test our ideas, our new techniques, we need scale. We want to have one project where we don't just renovate one single house, but where we can renovate 2,000 buildings. And there we can you know, train the workers, we can test new techniques, see what works at scale. And actually, if we want, if, you know, we want to help them, there is one particular sector that is perfect for that, and that's social housing. Because the companies that are, I mean, the organizations, they're not uh, companies really, uh, that are managing social housing, you know, tend to manage very, very large amounts of social housing. And that's what is currently happening um, uh, in several places in, uh, in Europe. But the one I know best in the, is in the west of France, in the regions uh, of Brittany and Pays de la Loire, where uh, this um, innovative uh, project of Enagis Fond is currently renovating 2,000 buildings. All of them are social housing buildings. And to me, that's a very concrete way uh, through which, with EU support, we can help make uh, the uh, poor people in Europe the first beneficiaries of the green transition. And that's a very concrete way where, with uh, targeted public support, you can achieve both an innovation uh, objective you know, making deep innovation cheaper and faster, and also a social objective, uh, which is to lift all Europeans from energy poverty. Thank you very much. So the next question has to do with um, innovation policy, and I think you've touched a lot on this uh, subject in your, in your recent publication. How can we change the force of regulation and punishment to self-motivation to reach the 17 goals of sustainable development? Yeah, um, it's actually something uh, that I find quite fascinating is the way politicians approach the issue of regulation and innovation. Um, some politicians, like, for instance, Manfred Weber, who is currently the leader of the EPP in the European Parliament, uh, say stuff like, um, I believe in innovation, uh, not in regulation, not in bans. And, and they tend to see you know, regulation as a punishment. And, and that's a very weird way, really, to look at regulation. I mean, it's, it's mainstream across many, many political families, but that's not the way academics look at regulation. Academics understand that sometimes you need to have very strict regulation, and those regulations can boost innovation if you give companies and innovators time and flexibility to test new solutions, to develop breakthrough innovations that will solve the problem in five to 10 years. So that's something that academics understand well. And our latest policy paper is built on a scientific review, a literature review of 30 scientific articles that kind of all point in the same direction. So there is a consensus among academia, among uh, scientific um, you know, professors, of, professors of universities mostly. Um, there is a consensus that uh, we can do regulation in a way that supports innovation. And when you talk to business leaders, and in the, the paper I mentioned, there is a, a quote from an investor uh, in a venture capital, and there is another quote from uh, Francesco Starace, who is the CEO of Enel, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, electricity suppliers in Europe. And, and both of them, them you know, see that sometimes you need regulation to force change. And so that's something that is really puzzling for me as a political scientist. Um, we see politicians having you know, this idea that regulation is bad for innovation. While when you talk to business leaders, they clearly understand that you need to have ambitious regulation to force change, to make sure that change happens sometimes. And when you look at what you know, uh, the science, so to say, uh, is uh, you know, the main conclusion is that yes, you know, in, in a lot of sectors, uh, you need to have this kind of very ambitious regulation in order to send a clear signal to innovators so people can create new stuff. Um, so really, I mean, uh, the, the way to do that, I, I think the compromise that we, we hopefully will agree on after one year and a half or two years of fighting inside the European Union on the, on the Fit for 55 package is that we need to have super ambitious 
regulations and they need to be stringent and enforceable. And a lot of vested interests will cry, but that's okay. Uh, because we know that a lot of companies, some of them big like NL, some of them small, like the startups that already exist, will have time and flexibility to find a solution. So in other words, you adopt a very ambitious uh, target, very ambitious standards, something that is stringent, that is enforceable. But also at the same time, uh, you give innovators time in some sectors, you know, it can only be a few years, in other sectors, it has to be 10 years, 15 years. And you also give them flexibility on the way to achieve that. So to take a concrete, concrete example, if we think about trucks, uh, how do we transport uh, heavy goods all across Europe? Uh, you may, for instance, decide that by, I don't know, 2038, uh, you won't uh, be able to buy a truck that runs on gasoline or on diesel, for instance. That's super ambitious. But if you say 2038, then you give you know, 17 years <laughs> Uh, for people to try stuff. Um, some you know, modal shift from the road to uh, sea lanes or to, uh, or to rail, but also new technologies for the trucks that we will continue to be using. And you give innovators the flexibility. So some of them will test uh, you know, a new generation of batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, some others will bet on green hydrogen. Others might be, bet on uh, uh, synthetic fuels. Uh, while other, you know, might also try other options like electrifying highways and many, many things that I can't even think of. Uh, and you give them space to test all those things. And in five years, in eight years, uh, after all those tests have been done, then we can see, you know, what, what works, what doesn't work, or what may work in specific situations and, and, and not in others. Thanks a lot. So we've already gone past the time limit, but there's still a lot of questions. So, so maybe I'm going to and they have to do with uh, global action for, for, for climate. Um, so the first one is a, a question that you already had uh, on your previous zero questions. What do you think about nuclear energy? Should it be considered as a green energy to get climate neutral? France and the United States of America are keen on this idea, but Germany and Italy are fondly against it. Um, the other question I would like, uh, I would like to, to, to ask you is from, a, from one of our um, auditors, uh, what proactive action can be expected to address existential threats such as deforestation of the Amazon, Congo, and Indonesia um, in the scope of a, a global action against climate? Um, and I think, yeah, I'll leave you with, with these, uh, these two questions. So, so, so I'm going to first answer the first question, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat the second one because I, I, I did not uh, uh, catch it uh, fully. Um, so, so yeah, um, so nuclear, I mean, it's, it's always a, a very, very, uh, you know, big topic. Uh, the first thing we should recall is that um, whatever happens with nuclear, uh, nuclear, in the best case scenario for nuclear, nuclear will only be a small solution to the climate change. Uh, so currently, uh, nuclear accounts for 11% of the European energy mix, only 11%. Uh, whatever happens with nuclear, it will you know, be anything between 5 and 15% in 2050. 5% in the case uh, in which a lot of countries adopt anti-nuclear policies, like what the Austrian or the Italians or the Germans have already done. And maybe up to 15% if a lot of countries adopt pro-nuclear policies like uh, Finland or like Poland or like Hungary. Uh, so I just want to put that in perspective because we tend to spend a lot of time on nuclear, but you know, what have, come what may, uh, what, whatever happens with nuclear, nuclear will, will only be a small element uh, of the uh, of the clean energy mix. Anything between zero and twenty percent, depend if you want to be very very broad. Uh, one of the current question is whether nuclear should be considered as green by the European Union under the EU Sustainable Finance Taxonomy. Um, and so we need to under, I mean, to answer that that question, we need to understand what is the the reasoning, the raison d'être uh, of the taxonomy. Um, the relation d'être of this taxonomy is to label stuff green or not green only based on the science. That's the reasoning behind it. The reasoning then goes that in order to be qualified as green, you need to show that you bring something that is positively green first. That's the first criteria. And the second criteria, you need to show that you do no significant harm to another environmental objective set in the taxonomy. 
So if we apply that to the case of nuclear, it's very clear that nuclear is good from a climate perspective. Um, nuclear is a way to produce electricity uh, with very, very little greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it emits more uh, than some wind power, but less than solar panels. And in any instance, it emits far, far less than gas power plants, coal power plants, oil power plants. So from a scientific perspective, there is no question that nuclear is good for climate. So from that perspective, it fulfills you know, the first criteria of the taxonomy. The question is whether nuclear can be considered as a source of energy that does no significant harm to other environmental objectives. Um, the main one that is currently being discussed is the issue of waste. Um, you know, one, I mean, it's not something that is linked to climate, but obviously we don't want to live uh, in a Europe where we have, you know, waste everywhere, especially if this waste is radioactive waste. So the question here, and it's difficult to answer that scientifically, and I think in the end it would be a political choice, but the question here is whether you consider that nuclear waste is, I mean, nuclear waste is doing harm to the environment and human health, that's for sure. The question is whether you consider that this harm is significant or not significant. If the decision is to say that nuclear waste is not doing significant harm to human health or to the environment, then that would be considered as green under the taxonomy. If the choice, which here again, I think in the end would be a political one, uh, uh, is to say that nuclear waste are so you know, dangerous that they are considered to do significant harm, then nuclear will not be uh, in the taxonomy. So that's kind of the debate as I understand it, at least for now. Uh, one thing, however, that I, I, I wanna raise um, and it's more for question, you know, um, a really a political question. Um, for the taxonomy to be used, it needs to be credible. Credibility is not something that is, you know, uh, produced by, by scientists. Credibility is always in the, high, in the eyes of the beholder. So in other words, uh, will citizens and investors consider that the European sustainable taxonomy is credible if this taxonomy labels nuclear as green? I have really trouble, you know, thinking about a world where uh, German, Austrian, Italian investors and citizens will consider nuclear to be uh, to be green. So I therefore also have my doubt about, you know, uh, the, the harm uh, to the credibility of the entire taxonomy uh, if nuclear were to be labeled uh, uh, as green. But this being said, you know, I, I don't really have a strong uh, uh, opinion on on this as a as a citizen. I'm just trying to lay out the debate as a as a researcher. Uh, and, and yeah, and it's going to be a tough call in any case uh, by the European policymakers because it's uh, definitely a very, very difficult debate and, you know, in the end, they will need to choose between two bad options. Thank you. So the, the next question I wanted to ask from, uh, from someone from the audience, um, do you think from the leaders uh, uh, summit on climate, uh, do you think proactive action can be expected to address uh, matters such as deforestation, for example? Um, I'm not sure about deforestation specifically because it's not an area uh, on which I, I work. So, so, so I'm sorry, I can't uh, answer specifically on that issue of uh, deforestation. Um, however, what I know we can expect from the, UCL from the uh, climate summit uh, um, uh, that is uh, happening uh, based on the invitation of Joe Biden, first we can expect uh, a US climate target for 2030. Uh, so this, is, should, this should be one of the announcements that Joe Biden makes uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and so depending on the level of that target, we will see uh, how ambitious uh, Joe Biden wants to be, not only for the long term, but also for the, uh, for the short term, uh, because 2030, you know, is that, I mean, the, the choices we make today will have a massive impact already in 2030. So that's one of the major things we, uh, we can expect. The second thing that we may have uh, is the beginning of an inclusion of India uh, in this club of countries that are uh, uh, looking at climate neutrality by 2050. And, and that would be quite important for the European Union uh, and also for the US uh, for two main reasons. The first one is that India uh, is you know, one of the most populated countries in the world and one of the biggest emitters in the world. Uh, and the second reason also is that India, despite all the limitation of democracy in India today under Narendra Modi, uh, India remains the biggest democracy in the world in terms of population. Uh, it's a massive democracy, uh, and it's therefore in the interest of two other democracies, the European Union and the US, to have a strong India on board um, in order to make sure that we don't only you know, fight climate change, 
but we do that in a way that supports also a more democratic global system. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think John Bowles is so important and there's a lot of pressure uh, and a lot of cooperation uh, on both the EU side and the US side to bring in John Bowles. Uh, thanks a lot. So um, I note that there are two two questions. Uh, so one concerned carbon border adjustment mechanism, and the other agriculture. So I won't ask them directly to to Thomas because these are two topics that uh, are worked on by our sister institute in Brussels, Europe Jacques Delors. Uh, so uh, for these two people, I invite you to check out the work on these two uh, subjects. The last question, however, I will ask for Thomas, and I think it's a perfect question to conclude the webinar. Is what are the most promising pressure points that offer hope and optimism, which people should further address? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think we really have our future in our own hands. Um, and I would, have, I would not have said that, you know, 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, uh, you know, making the shift to climate treaty looked like a super difficult thing to do. Um, 20 years ago, you know, almost zero kilowatt of electricity were produced by solar, by wind. Those were almost non-existing technologies that were super expensive. Um, electric cars were only prototypes, and there was no mobilization of citizens to really, you know, oblige governments to act on climate. Um, today, the situation is very different. Um, solar and wind power are the cheapest ways to produce electricity almost all over the world. Uh, electric cars are already today uh, a cheaper option, especially for people who drive a lot. Um, and we have also a lot of promising new technologies that will help uh, make the transition easier, uh, such as you know, solid state batteries or, or perovskite uh, solar panels and all these kind of things. Uh, and on top of that, we also have the mobilization of a significant segment uh, of a lot of societies, uh, mostly led obviously by young people, especially young students. Uh, I mean, Greta Thunberg is the icon uh, of that movement, but that movement is obviously, you know, far broader with literally, you know, millions uh, of uh, kids and young adults that are mobilized on, on, on climate. Um, so, um, so yeah, so obviously, you know, uh, technological improvements is definitely uh, not a silver bullet, uh, but it is something that makes the transition easier. Uh, the pol this political mobilization is really crucial and to me it is the most important thing. And so I'm quite optimistic of the fact that, um, you know, we can do it. Um, if you want me to be pessimistic, you know, I would say that in the end, you know, the, whatever happens will be fair. Either we get our acts together and we act today and we avoid a climate disaster and we would have deserved to avoid a climate disaster. Um, or we continue to dig our hands into the sand, do as if, you know, nothing was happening. Um, and then we will be in a climate disaster, but we would have also deserved it. It would have been, you know, a human choice. So, you know, both individually and collectively today, we have the choice. We have the choice to make the kind of changes that uh, will help avoid a climate disaster. And we know that those changes will actually be beneficial for human life uh, because it will be, you know, we will have a cleaner, a cleaner air, uh, more efficient housing. So that's all stuff that are beneficial, also create a lot of jobs. Um, so hopefully, you know, we will go down that route. Uh, if we don't hear again, that would be really, you know, uh, a choice that uh, our society would have made uh, uh, collectively. Uh, so, so yeah. So I just want to stand on the optimistic note. Uh, we really have, you know, if I want to end with that metaphor, we have all the ingredients for success. We have the political mobilization. We have the skilled workers. We have the right technologies. We have the money. Uh, we have the policy. Uh, at least the tools that we can transform to make the to make the right policy choices. So we have all the ingredients. Um, we also have a lot of recipes. Um, there are a lot of people that have been producing recipes on, on how to make, how to build a clean energy future. Uh, the question is whether we are going to, to, to make it or not. And I hope that collectively, uh, we will definitely uh, make it to make our lives better, but also to, to avoid a climate disaster in this century. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the, for the presentation and, and the whole uh, webinar. Um, before we, we finish this, uh, this event, I'd like to quickly present uh, the publications Thomas drew upon for his presentation today. Uh, they were all published uh, yesterday. Also to be noted that most of the slides in the presentation uh, were drawn from the infographics, Let's Innovate to Achieve Climate Neutrality, published yesterday as well. 
and all these elements will be sent over to you as a follow-up this afternoon. Uh, thank you for following this webinar. So the video will be available on our YouTube channel uh, and the next Euro questions will, will be exceptionally held on Thursday, May the 6th, ahead of the Porto Social Summit. Uh, we'll greet our senior research fellow, Sofia Fernandez. We'll talk about the EU social policy and the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. Thank you very much for your participation. Au revoir, merci beaucoup.